Hello and welcome to this series of videos on corpus linguistics. Uh, in the next couple of weeks we'll be talking about what corpus linguistics is. We'll start from the very basic notions and things that you need to understand in order to get you started. And then step by step we'll move on to more advanced uh, topics related to the field. So, yeah, without wasting your time with meaningless introductions, let us jump right into it. So corpus linguistics, such an interesting field, wouldn't you say? Alright, so what is corpus linguistics? To give you a very simple, very broad definition, corpus linguistics is the study of language using corpora, which is plural for corpus. I know that this is a weird plural, but hey, who am I to judge? I'm not even a native speaker of English. Anyway, so what does a corpus mean? Study language using a corpus. Well, corpus is a word which is derived from the Latin word, surprise, surprise, corpus, which literally translates to body. Now, obviously, body here does not refer to the physical body, rather, it refers to a body of texts. So, a corpus is simply, or to put it very broad, a collection or a body of texts. So, corpus linguistics is studying language using a collection of texts. How is this done, you might be wondering. I am glad you asked. Well, let us give an example to illustrate this point. Say that uh, you're an English teacher, all right, and uh, the happy little ones are your students, and say that you have been teaching them for about two years now, and at this point, you're interested in seeing how they use their English, and more specifically, you're interested in investigating the following. What are the three most frequent words that my students use in their writings? And you would also like to know how they use these words in their writings. So take a second here, and think, how would you do this? How would you investigate these two questions? Uh, pause the video if you like, and I will continue in three, two, and one. So, as you have rightly predicted, you'll start by collecting your students' writings. Then, you'll calculate the number of words that they have used in their writings. And then, once you have calculated all the words that, all the number of all the words that they have used, you will generate frequency lists of all these words and then rank them from the most frequent word to the least frequent word. Now say after doing this, you get the following results. The total numbers of words, the total number, sorry, of words that your students have used is 800 and the three most frequent ones are the, which occurred 48 times, for, which occurred 20 times, and I, which occurred 12 times. So concerning the first task, Give yourself a round of applause, you have successfully completed it. Now, how about the second task? Remember, you were interested in seeing how they use each of these words. So, in order to see how they use the word the, you need again to go back to the papers and look for all of the 48 instances of the word the. Then do the same for for, and then do the same for I. As you can already imagine, this is a laborious activity. It will take so much time and so much effort, and Chances are you may make certain mistakes calculating the number of words and so on and so forth. Because hey, we're all humans. We are not right all the time, right? And imagine if you had large amounts of data, say thousands of words or millions of words. It would be quite impossible, wouldn't you say? Yeah. So it would be lovely <laughs> if there were some software that can do this for you. Well, lucky for us, yeah, there are some software available. Let's do exactly this and more. So this software is what corpus linguists use in order to carry on linguistic research. So in a nutshell, this is what corpus linguistics is all about. So you as a researcher are interested in a certain linguistic phenomena. You collect your data or your corpus accordingly, that is according to your research objectives. And then in order to analyze uh, the data, you use some specific software. So, yeah, this is an oversimplification of what corpus linguistics is. So up until this point, we have given a very simplistic definition. Yeah, I use that word a lot, right? Anyway, we have given a very broad and very simplistic definition, and it doesn't really do justice to what corpus linguistics is. But yeah, it's helpful to, to get us started and to have a general idea of what, what is it that corpus linguists do. Now we'll move to more... Uh, informative and more detailed definition. We'll start with the corpus. 
So, we have seen that a corpus is a collection of texts, but it's more than that. A corpus is a principled and large collection or body of authentic texts that are stored in a computer and analyzed using software designed for corpus analysis. Now, I know that this is a large definition, but it's really interesting. Now, let us read this once again. A corpus is a principled and large collection of authentic texts that are stored in a computer and analyzed using software designed for corpus analysis. Now we have a bunch of keywords here and we need to stop at each one of them. So I'll highlight them for you. Here they are, principled, large collection, authentic text, stored in a computer, and software. Now take a second here, pause the video again if you'd like, and think about, this, uh, about the following. When we say principled, what do we mean by principled? And when we say large collection of authentic texts, what does authentic text refer to? And how large should it be? Is it hundreds of words? Thousands of words? Millions? Dare I say billions? Interesting. So in a computer, what can a computer do other than give us frequencies and so on and so forth? And what can a computer do? And finally, software. What software are we talking about? And are there any software available for the public? That is, for free. All right, so think about these questions and I will continue again in three, two, and one. So, a principled collection of texts. Let us go back to the example that we have started our conversation with, in which you were the teacher, you are interested in investigating your student's language and so on and so forth. So remember, you were interested in seeing how your students use English in their writings. So, what did you do? Did you collect your students' oral production? Did you collect your students' grammar assignments? No, you've collected your students' writings. So, since you have already a goal or an objective in mind, then you collect your data, data or data, according to that objective that you have. So, this is what we mean by principled collection of texts. Collecting the text for the corpus is a planned operation and not random. And researchers normally have a research question in mind before they start compiling or designing the corpus. So, yeah, collecting data for the corpus is not a random operation. You cannot just collect random texts and claim that these are uh, the texts for the corpus. It, it doesn't really work that way. So you need to have a goal in mind or an objective, a research objective, and then collect your data according to that objective. So that is for principle. Now, how about large collection of authentic texts? What do you mean by authentic texts? Well, to put it very simply, authentic texts refer to naturally occurring examples of language, be them spoken or written. And to give a quote by Sinclair, by the way, Sinclair is one of the most important scholars in corpus linguistics, and I highly suggest that you read his work. Anyway, to, put, uh, to use Sinclair's words, uh, authentic texts refer to genuine communications of people going about their normal business. So, I think that you already have an idea what authentic texts refer to. Naturally occurring examples of language, so not artificial, not controlled types of language, but rather how people use their language naturally, normally. Again, to give a very simplistic example, let's go back to the example in which you were the teacher and you are, again, are interested in investigating how your students use their English, but this time you are interested in seeing how they use their language orally. So, you can't give them uh, dialogues that are already provided in their coursework and make them uh, repeat these dialogues, record them, transcribe them and claim that this is your corpus. It's not really a corpus because that text is not authentic text. That oral production is not how your students use their language naturally. It, does not come, it did not come from them. Rather, they just repeated what other people have already written. So in order to collect authentic text from, their, from your students, your students have to use their language naturally. So this is what we mean by authentic texts. Now, for large collection of authentic texts, how large should this be? Well. There isn't really a straightforward answer, there isn't one definitive answer. Rather, uh, sorry, yeah, it will depend on the type of the corpus and the research objectives. So, I'll give you an example. Uh, the British National Corpus, the BNC, is a general corpus. So, it reflects how British people use English in a variety of contexts. So, that is why the British National Corpus is made of uh, 100 million words, yeah more than 100 million words, so it's quite large. But why? 
because the British National Corpus contains cor uh, texts that are collected from journals, from newspapers, from TV shows, from academic writings, novels, uh, people's normal everyday conversation, formal, informal, so on and so forth. So it's a large amount of data, but why? Because it should reflect how British people use English generally in a variety of contexts. So in this case, yeah, we need a large amount of data. But if you're interested in seeing how just a limited, a certain, very specific group of people use their language, be it English or Spanish or whatever, then you wouldn't need that huge amount of data. A few million words would suffice. So, how large should the corpus be? It will depend on your research objectives and the type of the corpus that you're going for, but the convention is that it's usually millions of words, although it's not always the case. So, you do your own readings and you, you'll discover things on your own. Anyway, why large and why authentic? Well, remember that a corpus is a representative sample of language use. You cannot possibly collect all of the instances of any language. It's quite impossible. You need to, to be with all of the people at the same time and record their conversations and so on all the time. And that's quite impossible. So a corpus should be large enough and authentic enough so that it represents the language you intend to investigate. So that is why we need as large as possible amounts of data and of course it should be authentic. Alright, so moving on. Sort in a computer. Sort, sorry, in a computer. Now, why do we need to sort our data in a computer? I think it's quite obvious, come on. Yeah, sorting text in a computer makes the corpus analysis easy, more precise and more, what? More accurate. So a computer allows for fast and accurate analysis of large amounts of data. Now, why did they use the word, the word accurate between inverted commas? Of course, the corpus, the sorry, the computer can give you very precise, very accurate numbers. Yeah, there is no doubt about that. But is the analysis accurate? Well, that will depend on how you design the corpus, what statistical measures you used to analyze your data, so on and so forth. We'll talk about statistics in corpus linguistics in later videos. So, what more? Yeah, computer can give insights into patterns not easily detectable by humans. Well, since a computer analyzes millions and millions of data, then, of course, some patterns will emerge, and these patterns may not be uh, easily detectable by us or following our intuition. So, a computer has that, the, that advantage. And, unfortunately, since everything has its limitations, well, a computer too, no matter how good it is, has its limitations. I'll give you an example. Uh, there is an interesting research carried out by this gentleman here, Dr. Uh, Brezina, who is also, by the way, one of the most important scholars in modern corpus, corpus linguistics. Uh, what can corpora tell us about learning a foreign language? Quite a lot, actually. Anyway, he did a, quite a very interesting research in which he found that male British speakers use personal pronouns less than female British speakers. Now, this is something that a computer can tell you in terms of numbers and frequencies and so on. But a computer cannot tell you why. Why do female British speakers use personal pronouns more than male speakers do? A computer cannot tell you that. So it is up to you, the researcher, to give qualitative explanations to the data. So a computer can give you quantitative analysis very precisely and very accurately. And it's up to you, the researcher, to do whatever qualitative interpretations of that data. All right. Now, software for corpus analysis. And I know that this is what you are interested in. You want to have some fun in investigating the whatever language you are interested in and so on. So, so anyway, software for corpus analysis. Are there any software available for free? Are there any good ones? Well, my friend, yes. I, there are a bunch of them, but I, I highly suggest these two, Lansbox and Antconc. They are available for free. They do not take much space in your computer, which is always a plus. And they are user-friendly. They are fairly easy to use. And yeah, you can carry out your first corpus analysis using either one of these two. And I will talk about them in, uh, in future videos. Anyway, so what does a corpus look like? Very simply, 
This is a corpus, just a collection of texts which are collected according to one's research objectives. That's it. So, what is corpus linguistics? To go again, to go back to the question that we have started our presentation with. Well, yes, we have seen that corpus linguistics is the study of language using corpora. What else? Corpus linguistics is not a theory of language. So it does not explain how we acquire language or whatever, any of that. It's just a tool or a method to study language and investigate linguistic phenomena. That's it. So, to conclude, what have we learned today? I'll ask you some questions. Do not cheat and make sure to answer them to see if you have grasped, grasped most of the ideas presented in this video. So, what is a corpus? Yeah? Alright, yeah. A corpus is a large collection of authentic texts that are stored in a computer, analyzed using software, designed for corpus analysis. Why principled and large collection of authentic texts? Hmm? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, yeah. According to one's objectives, a corpus should be a representative sample of language use in light of those objectives. So if you are interested in seeing how people use, for instance, Spanish orally in Spain, then you need to collect oral data of Spanish production again in Spain. So on and so forth. Uh, what else? Yeah. What is corpus linguistics? This is a fairly easy question. And I know that you'll get this one right. Yeah. Yeah. Corpus linguistics is the study of language simply using corpora. It is not a theory of language. It's only a tool or a method to investigate linguistic phenomena. So, yeah. One of uh, some of the important scholars and these are by no means the most important ones, but some of them. Uh, there is Leach, Biber, Conrad, McCarthy, and of course Brezina. I highly suggest that you read some of their their work. They're really informative and yeah. But many consider Sinclair to be yeah one of the most important scholars in corpus linguistics or at least modern corpus linguistics. And yeah, I highly suggest that you read uh, Sinclair's work. So. Here are some references to get you started. You can read either start by any one of these. They are they are highly informative. They helped me a lot when I first started uh, learning about corpus linguistics, and I highly suggest that you read them, or at least one of them. So this brings us to the end of the video. I think that uh, I hope not. I think I hope that you have enjoyed it, and I hope that you have learned, or at least I have answered some of your questions. And if you have further questions, don't hesitate to leave your questions in the comment section down below. I'll do my best to answer all of your questions. If the question requires another video, I'll gladly post another video. And yeah, have a good week, have a good month, have a good year, and see you in the next video. Bye-bye, ciao, ciao.